Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. It's time for our one-to-one -one interview and my guest is one of the European Parliament's most outspoken members on key issues such as migrants, climate change and the transatlantic free trade talks. Yannick Jadot is a member of the Group of the Greens and Vice President of the Parliament's Committee on International Trade. Before becoming a politician, he was campaigns director for Greenpeace France. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'd like to start with the migrant crisis and the rise of the far right in Europe off the back of that migrant crisis, particularly in Austria, which is a big talking point at the moment. What do you think the European response should be to this rising populism? I think to tell the truth to the European citizens, I mean, uh, we have uh, a common responsibility. Uh, we have an obligation to welcome the migrants, especially those coming from uh, Syria, from uh, Somalia, from uh, Iraq, from uh, Afghanistan. They are uh, trying to, uh, to save their lives. And uh, again, it's uh, an obligation. I mean, in the international convention, we have to welcome these people. And now, rather than building, as somehow uh, uh, Angela Merkel did in Germany, to say that it's a challenge, it will not be easy, but it is our responsibility, and we should work together to make it somehow a success for Europe mm -hmm. in history. We have all these leaders, or so-called leaders, who are just playing their, their worst national opinion. The leaders should tell the truth, say that, you know, it's our responsibility and we have a capacity to do so if we do it collectively. The risk, obviously, is that if they say, if they tell the truth, as you're pointing out, and say we have an obligation to help these people because they're running for their lives, the risk of that is people will say, well, unfortunately, there aren't enough jobs. Yes, I understand, because uh, that's true that many political leaders are saying that, you know, the migrant will compete with you for your job, for your home, for the little social benefits you could get. You know, the point is that Europe is a rich continent with strong inequalities, social inequalities, but a rich continent. You cannot say, you know, the, the deal which should be made now in Europe. Greece needs solidarity. Germany now needs solidarity with this migrant issue. And the whole Europe needs investment, you know, to develop energy transition, to develop investment in, in buildings, uh, to uh, try to, in, in, on health. We know that many economic sectors need investment to create jobs. So, I mean, we could so have mean a it deal. it needs labor. The European industries actually need a bigger workforce, you're saying, which could be filled by migrants. First, if they're first, skilled enough, if all, they're skilled to do that yes, job. Yes, but you know, some of we know that uh, those migrants, especially those coming from Syria, are qualified migrants. Second, I mean, in all European countries, many jobs are occupied by migrants because nationals, they do not want to do it anymore. You know, even in the French uh, suburbs where there is a, a social crisis, you have 50, 60 percent of the of the doctors uh, who are migrants, you know, and we know in many sectors, in the building sector and everything. Mm -hmm. But so this again, is, yeah. again, I mean, beyond this issue, mm -hmm. since we have the problem in front of you, we cannot say that there are millions of people suffering. There are millions of people trying to escape you know, uh, bombings, uh, torture, dictatorship. And they are, we, uh, what, what are we going to do? We are going to sh shoot on them, not to make sure that they do not get into Europe, or we face the reality. And again, it's a huge challenge. I do not say that it's easy. But we face the, the reality, and we do it collectively, not based on the uh, nationalisms, not based on avoiding the reality, but based on common responsibility and, sh and fair uh, burden sharing between European countries, which is far from being the case right now. 
I'd like to move on to some other issues that you work on very much in uh, the European Parliament. And first of all, on transparency and corruption, uh, Britain has uh, wrapped up an international summit on corruption, and that topic will also loom large at the G7 in Japan at the end of this month. Of course, the Panama Papers have cast a long shadow, both over the London Anti-Corruption Summit and the upcoming G7. Let's take a closer look now with our report. The international summit in London comes less than a month after the release of the Panama Papers that revealed how global elites use anonymous companies to avoid paying tax. Crucially, they also put the spotlight on Britain. Among the companies cited, more than half are incorporated in British overseas tax havens and some of them have been used to buy property in Britain. This has led David Cameron to announce a series of measures to ensure the money is clean. I believe that corruption is the cancer at the heart of so many problems we need to tackle in our world. Under the proposed plan, foreign firms that own or seek to buy property in the UK would have to declare their assets in a public register and reveal the true identity of their owners. According to the government, these measures would make potentially suspicious investments more easily traceable by British tax authorities. But critics say it's the global culture of corruption that needs to be shifted. I think it's a really important step, but it needs to go further because, you know, this is like a game of whack-a-mole. If you kind of hit the problem somewhere, it can pop, pop up somewhere else. Uh, and we've seen again and again how places like the British Virgin Islands are used to launder money. Uh, and we need to crack down on that through transparency of companies, of trusts. Some of the UK's territories and Crown dependencies have agreed to share their own company ownership registers with tax authorities in 33 countries around the world but campaigners say they should go one step further and make their registers public. Leaders of the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands say that while they are committed to more transparency, such measures would undermine their clients' right to privacy. So this registry of interests, does, does that really work, uh, Yannick Jadot, if we have certain countries that are not part of the system? We need a group of countries to move forward when strong countries, powerful countries are doing so. The others are somehow at certain time obliged to follow the move. And you know now, I mean, we were talking about two or three trillions. Uh, uh, we know that the tax evasion in Europe is 1,000 billion euros every year. That means this money is missing in all public budget for education, health, and, and you know, just uh, social benefits. Is Europe providing enough leadership then no, so that other countries no, fall, we know fall that. in line? We know that. I mean, uh, remember Switzerland, uh, the US, you know, in a couple of weeks decided what we call the FACTA to, have, uh, to, to ban uh, bank secrecy from Switzerland. And with a strong threat that any uh, financial subsidiary from Swiss Bank will not be allowed in the US. So they got the point. And EU is still because, you know, tax is a national competence in Europe. There is no European competence on tax. That means each time you have uh, the Netherlands, you have Austria, you have Luxembourg, UK has not been very good in the last 10 or 15 years uh, fighting uh, tax evasion and tax fraud. And so you have one country with a veto saying that the others cannot do anything. So, so you... this is ridiculous. So we need to move with groups of countries which are willing to, uh, to, to act by example and the others will follow. We c the statu quo is not just so acceptable. For you, the next step would be a European tax authority with of powers, course. which obviously would be resisted by member states for, of for course, the, for but the you know, reasons. UK, one of the last announcements uh, three weeks ago was to reduce by two the level of tax on companies, uh, trying to get the most attractive tax uh, uh, country for uh, the big companies. This is totally unacceptable. This competition by the worst is totally unacceptable because doing that way, not a single country can act seriously for general interest. So we need Europe to do that. 
Without Europe, it's lost. We need Europe to do that, but we need to make it a collective responsibility. The uh, TTIP negotiations, which you've uh, obviously talked about a lot, this is the transatlantic uh, free trade deal, which has not been completed yet. Uh, that is something that you've said is not being carried out in a transparent way, and particularly in terms of the next steps uh, of how it's going to be approved. Just walk us through those steps now. We have two big agreements in front of us. The, as you say, the TTIP negotiation, they are a bit stuck because if you listen to the, uh, the, the main candidate in the US election, they have, they have now kind of uh, untie free trade uh, speeches. So, I mean, not even, Trump is, of course, the most crazy guy, but even Clinton, I mean, uh, so, now, I mean, there is no sp political space for negotiating the TTIP agreement. But we have the agreement, the free trade agreement with Canada, which is coming before the Council, the European Council and the European Parliament for ratification. It's, you know, the, tr the, 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 the a small TTIP. It has exactly the same type of risk for our health, for our environment, for our right to regulate, for our democracy. For example, from this investor to state dispute settlement, privatization of the law system. So, I mean, with all this, I mean, there is a feeling in the all European citizens that this deal is made not only without us, without them, but against the citizens. And, and national parliaments can't reject this Canadian treaty. Of course it can. I mean, this is with the Lisbon Treaty now. The European Parliament has the capacity to say no to a trade agreement. It did so on the uh, uh, ACTA agreement, which was to, to fight against uh, counterfeiting, but in the very benefits of the uh, multinationals. So the parliament said no, and it was dead. So what the European national, parliament... Yeah, and national parliaments? Uh, because these agreements are very uh, huge, they're talking about, you know, our norms, standards, health, public services, everything, and it's talking about investment and economic governance. So we, there is a mixed competence, what we say. It's a European competence and it's a national competence. So the ratification process will have to include national parliaments. But the tricky thing with our government is that they say that there will be, for example, in Canada, if it is approved by the European Parliament, there will be a provisional application before the national parliaments are, are ratifying this agreement. Right. So it's just crazy how you can say to European citizens that their uh, parliament have not yet say what they think about a trade agreement and that it is already applied. That makes people crazy. A major topic that you've uh, called on people to keep an eye on is the follow-up from the COP21 in Paris a few months ago. Uh, this is something that isn't really in the public eye so much, or at least not in the media. Uh, do you sense that uh, the pledges made there, that the commitments or the, the sort of energy that was there at the Paris summit, that it still exists, or that there's been some kind of diluting of the ambitions that were... Uh, that were put forward there? Uh, I think the second option is the most uh, accurate uh, in the sense that, you know, in the Paris Agreement, we managed to have an agreement on an objective not to uh, go beyond 1.5 degree by the end of the year or uh, under 2 anyway. So that means that you have to disinvest from fossil fuels to uh, efficiency and renewables. And what we see now is most of the countries are just doing uh, the, the, the energy policy as business as usual. I mean, there is no strong impetus to go for an energy transition, uh, a carbon-free economy. We have cities, regions, citizens, which are already acting in favor of fighting climate change. They are already engaging 
strong changes on energy, mobility, agriculture, in many things. Uh, and you have governments which are stuck to the old world with big companies, with oil, with gas, with nuclear, with coal. It's so, so totally crazy. What's the solution? Where, where's the impetus for change going to come from? Now it's coming from the business community. I mean, there is every year more private investment in renewables than the year before. In, in technologies to make in, them in more affordable. For example, it's already affordable. You know, if you look at the price for photovoltaic, you know, the price has been divided by five over the last 10 years. If you look at Germany, if you look at the Nordic countries in Europe, they are really clear now on renewables, on efficiency, and we can see that their economies is going better than, for example, the French one. They are uh, uh, they are uh, they have more jobs in, uh, in the energy sector than ever, and they have more innovation and small enterprises all over the, 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 their territories. We'll have to end it there. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for being our guest on Talking Europe. Thank you Europe. for the invitation. Yannick Jadot, member of the group of the Greens at the European Parliament. Uh, more news coming up shortly on France 24.